what would the perfect community look like to you? I mean, what kind of people would you be around, and how would people treat each other? Now, I'm sure when I asked what kind of the perfect community you would want to be in, many people would say one in the beach or at the mountains. I get that. I don't mean location. But real quick, we're going to take a survey because I found there's three types of people in the world. You are a beach person, you are a mountain person, or you are a lake person, all right? So raise your hand. How many of you would say you're a beach person, all right? How many of you are mountain people? And how many are lake people? All right, I was surprised. I thought the beach would win, but our mountain people won. I am a mountain person. I love being in the mountains. But I'm not talking about our location. Our community location isn't what I'm talking about. I mean, how would you want the people around you to be? What would your community look like? And I'm willing to bet that everyone here would want to be around people who are loving, who are kind, who took care of each other. And I bet you would be one, want to be part of a community that had things in common like love, like joy, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. You'd want all those to be prevalent in your community. We would all want that. And I know that any of us that were rational people would want to live in a community like that. I'm sure there's some sickos who say, I don't want to be in a community where people love each other. Well, then you can go off into your crazy area. We all want to be in a community where people love each other. They take care of each other. That is why God understood what was going on and why he made the church the way he made it. Why it started in the form it did. God's plans, his ways, his guidelines, his laws, they're all for our benefit. And so he made the church in this form because he knew we needed a community that loved each other and took care of each other. And so we are a people who are committed to following those. And when we do, we see this love and this joy and this kindness. And it would be natural for people to want to be part of this amazing community. But it starts here. You see, the level of godliness within a community starts with how much influence we let God have individually in our lives. The level of godliness within a community starts with how much influence we let God have individually in our lives. And that is what the early church understood. So after 3,000 people were baptized, we see what happens next in Acts 22 or Acts 2, 42 through 47. These, these verses right here, you, we could do an entire series on, and we're just going to do today, but we're going to jump in and move through them pretty quick. Acts 2, 42 says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church started and they met together and they began to do life together. The English word for church is actually maybe a little bit different than what you thought. A lot of people see the Greek word in the Bible, which is ecclesia, which is what we get church. But the Greek word actually is an English word based off a Greek word of kyriakos, which means belonging to the Lord. And the word used in the New Testament was Greek was ecclesia, and that means called out, and it referenced an assembly of people. So when you combine all these words together, we get a definition of the church, and here's what it is. It is an assembly of people called out to specifically belong to the Lord. It isn't just a gathering, it's much more, and we see that much more, what much more looked like in these verses, because we get to see what they were devoted to. They were devoted to these things individually, and that's what built the church, because you see, what we are devoted to will define who we are. You can tell what people are devoted to. It's obvious to tell what somebody's devoted to by their schedule and by their checkbook. You look at those two things, and you can see what people are devoted to. And I've said that before, and after I've said that, it's no joke, I've had people after the service that want to argue with me when I said that. They say, they say, yeah, I spent a lot of time doing this or that, but that doesn't mean I don't love God. And I've said to them, I didn't say you don't love God. What I said is you love that more than God. There's a big difference. And trust me, you're not alone. This isn't just for you, this is for me. I know at times in my life where I have put things before God because my schedule and my checkbook showed that I clearly put something before God. God, we all do that, but what we're devoted to will define us. I was a youth minister for a long time, and uh, I'm out there at Chandler, I had a lot of kids, and I had a parent come to me one day and said, hey, my kid does not want to come to church. They don't like it. They don't want to come. 
Now, here's the thing. I had maybe seen that parent once or twice at church myself. They had not been around, and, and so I said, and this may have been a little bit harsh, but I, I needed to tell them the truth. I said, the kids are just following the example that you set. You see, I am not sure what you want me to do about it, is what I told them. Your devotion to your cabin on the weekends has decided what they look like. Because our devotion will determine what we look like. Our devotion will determine what our kids look like. We get to decide what we are devoted to, and when we make the right choices, then we'll see growth. And we see that the early church was devoted to four things. And I do realize that as we look at these areas, things have changed. Our communities look totally different. We're not agrarian societies. There's not a central market that people walk to, and everybody's kind of clustered together. I get that. And so some of the ways we do things look a little different, but I think we can apply it to our lives today. And I have some questions after each of these I want us to think about as we look at this. So the first thing they were devoted to was this, to the apostles' teaching. And the key is here is devoted to the teaching. I tried to think about what that meant. I tried to think about when I was in school, and I'll be honest, I wasn't devoted to any teaching when I was a kid in school. I didn't want to be there. I I didn't want to sit there. I wanted to go do something else. I was not devoted to the teaching. So I began to think about what that looks like, and I thought about my favorite preacher. Preachers have favorite preachers. My favorite preacher is Jeff Walling. You you may not have even heard of him. He is a professor at Pepperdine. He is absolutely my favorite preacher. Whenever he speaks, I want to go, and I want to listen. I'm like, dude, he's so good. That's devoted to the teaching, and that's what it means. These people were showing up thinking, yes. I get to hear the apostles teach. Now, here's the thing about this teaching. It was really important. Remember all these people just a week ago became Christians. And so they didn't know about this Jesus guy. They knew about the Old Testament. They knew about all the laws. They didn't know about the life of Jesus. They didn't know about this grace he was teaching. They didn't know how he fulfilled the messianic prophecies. And so everything they were teaching was ground level. And so these people were hungry. Every single day they came and they said, yeah, we need to know more. We need to know more about Jesus. We need to know more about Jesus. They were hungry to understand this Messiah. And so they were devoted to the teachings. They were devoted to hearing what the apostles had to say. But for us, here's the thing, it's a little different for us. Because they basically meant they attended all the preaching services. Well, we just have one service a week, basically. But for us, it would be this, it would be us getting to read our Bible every day. Because what they taught is in God's word. And so they were devoted to hearing God's word. That's the only way they could learn it. We should be devoted to being in God's word. So that we can learn. 2 Timothy 3 says this. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Have you ever been told to do a job that you had no idea how to do? Maybe, you know, whenever I was a kid, I worked at a uh, burger shop. And they said, hey, go make, you know, this ice cream cone. And every time I did, it was falling over the edge. It was just, I go, you need to show me. I need to be equipped to do this job. And what he's telling us is this is the teaching of the apostles, which is in our Bible, and us reading it equips us to live as Christians. That's why it is so important for the church, not just corporately, but individually. Your individual study in depth makes a difference to the whole body. Does that make sense? I know a lot of people are like, well, this is just for me. No, it's not. You growing and you understanding God and being able to teach about God and and knowing these things affects all of us. Because we are in this together. Knowing God's word is useful in so many ways that build up the body of Christ. So here's my questions for us and for me. What is our level of knowledge about God? (laughs) Have I devoted myself to knowing God? I've got a great book. And and if you're into some heavy reading, it is that literally the book is called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's deep. It's one of those books where you'll read a page and then you'll just think to yourself, I need to find a dictionary and define a few words. Then you'll read that page again and be like, oh, that's good stuff. That's what it is. It's called Knowing God by J.F. It's an amazing, amazing book. But my question is, are we devoted to knowing God? And what does that look like? And the reality is that us knowing God personally will define our community. You see, a church that is thriving devotes themselves to knowing God through his word. 
A church that is thriving devotes themselves to knowing God through his word. Next, they devoted themselves to fellowship. You've heard me talk about fellowship. I struggle with this word and the way we use it today, but it meant so much more back then. It's the Greek word koinonia, and that meant all of these verses combined, sharing everything, caring for each other, having relationships centered around everyone's love for God. It wasn't just getting together for a bit. This was a deep, caring relationship. It's lived out what Philippians 2 says. It says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is what this means. When he says they were devoted to fellowship, it meant this. It meant that they are participating in not just what they were interested in, but what was good for the body. They did things that, was, that were good for the body, and I get it. There are things that I don't want to do, but we do it because it is lifting up others and it is good for the body. We are devoted to each other, and that means we sacrifice for the sake of each other. I always use this example because it's the most obvious, but serving in children's ministry is this idea of devoted to fellowship. It is a caring enough about the body to give up your time and energy. It allows other believers to come and hear a message. It allows new people to come and hear the message. And it teaches our kids in a way they can understand. I'll be honest, when we did the online church stuff, my kids fell asleep at my sermons. I mean, no, it's, it's a rough deal when you're the dad and you preach it and your kid's falling asleep. You're like, come on, man. But these, this service isn't for little kids. They don't get what I'm talking about. We want them to learn stuff that they can learn. And that's why we have people that are dedicated to children's ministry so that they can teach them in a way they can understand. See, fellowship isn't just having coffee together. It's valuing others above ourselves. So here's my questions for us. Am I intentionally building relationships that keep us strong? Am I devoted to others enough to sacrifice some of my own desires or preferences? Because here's why. A church that is thriving devotes themselves to doing life together and caring for each other. A church that is thriving devotes themselves to doing life together and caring for each other. And I want us to be a thriving church. I want us to be a thriving church. The next thing they devoted themselves was the breaking of bread. Now what this means is exactly is a little bit tough. Here's why. They use the same word in the Bible several times for a meal as well as communion. And so sometimes it's hard to tell exactly which one it is. But in this particular verse, if you look at the Greek, it says they use the phrase, the breaking of the bread. So it's pretty clear what they did was every single day they got together and they celebrated communion. Now, they very well may have had a meal before that, but they celebrated communion all the time. And the reason they did was because they were celebrating Jesus' death and resurrection for their salvation daily. And it makes sense. You know why it makes sense? It's fresh on our mind. Have you ever had something when you promised, I'm going to do this every single day? This is important enough, I'm going to do it every day. New Year's resolutions, whatever it happens to be. About three weeks in, you're kind of like, yeah, that's not going to happen anymore. You don't actually say that, it just doesn't happen. Because it was fresh on your mind, so you kept doing it. That's the same thing with this. It was so fresh on their minds, they did it every single day. And here's the why, probably. If you remember, when all the people came and they were baptized on that day, 50 days after Jesus had been crucified um, and all that type of stuff, it was fresh on their mind. These same people who were in the crowd yell, crucify Jesus, want to remember his sacrifice for their salvation. Because they've done a 180. They've gone the complete different direction. They want to remember what Jesus did for them. So every day they got together and they were remembering this sacrifice that Jesus had made. Now, we do it every week, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, why don't we do it every day? Well, it seems as the church continued to um, move and progress and to grow, it says this in Acts 27. It says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. It looks like they began to break bread on the first day of the week, which is what we do, to break the bread to celebrate Jesus' salvation. But the point is this. They dedicated themselves to not just coming together as a group, but focusing on the sacrifice that allowed them to be saved. So here's my questions for us. Do we remember the sacrifice that paid for our sins? Is that something we regularly think of, or do we just think about it for that one minute during communion? You see, a church that is thriving continually focuses on the source of our salvation, During this time when we were at home and we weren't able to get out, I'll be honest, I really 
grew in looking at blessings and looking at the source of our salvation and understanding what God was doing for us. It's something I needed to grow in, and I was able to do that. And it changes your mindset when we realize the church that is thriving continually focuses on the source of our salvation and focusing on the blessings that we have in Jesus. Well, this other thing that they were devoted to was prayer. And that is exactly what it sounds like. Asking God to move, thanking God for salvation, asking God for direction and praying, praising his holy name. And they knew already that the only way God's message could move forward was through his power and prayer is tapping into that power. So they devoted themselves to prayer. Now here's what devoted means. It doesn't mean they devoted themselves to prayer every time they had a meal. That's not what it means. They didn't only pray when they were having dinner. And unfortunately, some of us have gotten into that habit. I know sometimes I get into that habit that the only time that we pray is when we are having a meal. But it, says, but it means they are fervently and steadfastly in prayer. This word devoted that we keep using, in many translations, it's actually the word steadfastly. And so that means they did it all the time. I mean, you can be devoted to something, but steadfastly means you're just continually doing it over and over. And that's what they did. It wasn't irregular or whenever they thought about it. They did all these things daily, understanding the importance of it. And prayer is one of, if not the most important thing we can do. God can do so much more than we can. And we talked about um, that last week. They understood the importance and steadfastly prayed for God to move. Ephesians 6.18 says this. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You might be thinking, I I haven't read that verse. That's because here's why. (laughs) This happens a lot in the Bible. There's a famous section, and then there's a verse right after it, and nobody ever reads it. It's like John 3.16, and nobody reads John 3.17. That's how this works. This verse is immediately after the armor of God. So everybody goes through all the armor, you know, press play, helmet, all that stuff, and they stop. And then this. It says this, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Paul's saying pray all kinds of prayers. Pray for each other. God is listening. And so here's my questions for us. Do we pray fervently? Do we ask for God's power to be thriving in our life, in our community? I, I can't tell you how much often I pray for revival. I don't mean a revival we meet every night. I mean revival of hearts in our community all the time. I learned that when I was in Arizona. I pray for all the time. I pray for revival for our people. I pray for revival for our community. That's what this means. God, move. God, move. Have your spirit move. You see, a church that is thriving is praying steadfastly for God to move. We are all praying for God to move. So they not only devote themselves to these areas, but also to care for each other at an extreme level. It just wasn't talk for these guys. So let's look at that real quick. Verse 44 and 45, it says this. All believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. This was extreme generosity. And living out these concepts as a church. Maybe you know somebody like that. You know somebody that will literally give you the shirt off their back. If, they, if you had a need, they're that type of person. But the whole church was like this. Now obviously this would be tough to do today. The way people lived was different. But it was necessary because of the new converts needed to survive. Here's the other thing. This will help for next week. If somebody was born with a, uh, a handicap of some sort. Then, then a lot of people would believe, they would say this, they'd say, well, who sinned? We'll see that next week. I say that, was it them or was it their parents? Who's the one that sinned here? And so the only way that these people would be able to survive was by begging. And they'd be on the side just begging because there was nothing to take care of them. And you know what the church did? The church took care of them. The church helped them. And many people who converted to Christianity were probably kicked out of their family. A lot of the Jews were kicked out. They were kicked out of the marketplace. There was a lot of things that they could not interact in with uh, business. And so they had to be taken care of because they had no way of surviving when they followed Jesus. See, we're blessed. We're, we're free. We get to live in a country where choosing to follow Jesus, we can do that without this type of ostracism. I mean, if you choose to follow Jesus, you can keep your job and you can still go shop at Walmart. You may not want to, but you can't. You you have those options. You aren't kicked out. But many of these people were. You see, this type of care that the Christians had for each other made an impact in their community. The word was spreading that these Christians loved each other and took care of each other. And you know what people did then? They were like, well, that's kind of interesting. That's the community I want to be in. 
I want to be around people like that. They love each other and they have joy and they care and, and they help each other. That's the community I want to be in. And that allowed for the gospel to spread. I mean, think about how it grew. It started with 3,000 and today there are 2 billion people in the world who claim to be Christians. That's a lot. That is a lot. And it was because of these values to God and to each other. They loved God, they loved people, and they shared Jesus. This dedication to each other made people see God's love, and it still works today. People see when we take care of each other. We had the um, big storm and the power, you know, went out for whatever it was, four or five days for all the people in this uh, neighborhood. And a bunch of people from SHCC showed up at some different houses. Well, we had one lady uh, make this comment. She, she said, SHCC is the best church in town because of how all people show up to help each other. Now, I'm not sure that it's a comparison game, but I appreciated the point because you know what she noticed? The church looked like the church. She noticed the church looked like the church. And she, I don't know that she even attends anywhere. As somebody who's not even necessarily, I don't even know she's a Christian necessarily, but she noticed that the church was being the church. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe something's different. Maybe these people really do believe what they say they believe. You, you see, that is how the church started. That is how the church grew. People noticed. We also see that they met regularly to encourage each other. Verse 46 47, the first part. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is the idea of small groups, big groups. They met in the temple courts, and uh, you can imagine the uproar with 3,000 people show up or whatever it is in the temple courts to praise Jesus, the guys, the guys in there killed. And so they're in there praising, and then they go home into small groups. And small groups are so important because in worship, you're usually looking at the back of someone's head, all right? You're not having a face-to-face -face conversation. That's why small groups are so important. And that's what they did. And our goal as a church is to begin to build those this fall. So that there are strong relationships. You have the big group of worship together and small groups of doing life together. And they did all this while praising God and making an impact in the community. And then we see the outcome. This is one of my favorite statements in the entire Bible. Into verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. <laughs> daily. Every day they had to heat up the baptistry. I don't know how they did that, but every day new people were saying, I want to follow Jesus. People were accepting Jesus as their boss and savior every single, how awesome would that be? And here's the thing, that can't happen today. <laughs> it's not just because the church started back then, it can happen today. It can happen in our community, and the reality is it's kind of up to us. I love when I get a phone call from somebody and they go, hey, I got somebody that wants to be baptized. Yes. You're going to do it? Yes. That's awesome. pastor doesn't have to do it. There's nothing special about me baptizing somebody, you baptizing somebody. Go find somebody, lead them to Jesus, and come baptize them. It's not even that cold right now anyway. So even during the week, it's fine, all right? Come and do it. We can live that out right now, and when we choose to dedicate ourselves to knowing God through his word, when we dedicate ourselves to caring for each other, we dedicate ourselves to remember the source of our salvation, and we dedicate ourselves to prayer, we will see the same results. We will be blessed to see people being saved daily. And here's the thing. There's a lot of things in the Bible that aren't necessarily recipes. I think this is a recipe. If we dedicate ourselves to those things, I think we will see that final result. When Christy and I were first married, um, I'm not a very good cook at all right now as it is. I'm just a terrible cook. But one day... We've been married just a few months. I decided I was going to make cookies, and I told her I don't need her stinking recipe. I'm, I can do this. So I got some stuff that I thought went into cookies, put it all in a pot, threw it in the oven, and I cooked it. I don't know what came out. It was disgusting. Tasted nothing like cookies. It was awful. I realized at that point, I need a recipe. I'm no good at this. I think this is a recipe, not a recipe for disaster like what I had but a recipe to change the world, a recipe to change our community. When we devote ourselves to these things, we will have the final product. The final product will turn out perfectly. It will be a perfect recipe that combines to make a perfect end. And I pray that we get to see that day. 
And as we finish up, I want to paint you a picture. A picture of a community that loves and cares about each other. One that is there for others and that has one goal in mind. And that overarching goal was to spread the message of Jesus. And that is what the church looked like. But that goal was only achieved when they lived out the first part. When they lived out God's love amongst themselves. People wanted to know why they were different. You see, they lived differently. We can't do evangelism and talk about how great God is at the same time not following God. You see, that doesn't work. People want practical in their life. They don't want to be told this works if they don't see it. They want to see the church and go, man, they love each other. They care about each other. That's why so many people run from the church. Because we say we believe these things and we say we're like that and then we're not. They don't see us being the church often. Now, I will say this. I do believe our church does a pretty good job of this. Um, a lot of times, somebody has a need, we try to fill it. We try to help. We're there for each other after the storm other times. I think we do it. But it's even more than that. It's how do we talk about others? How do we talk about the church? And I am sure, as the pastor, I give you many reasons to complain about this church. I get it. I get that part. But how can we look at the positive? And we don't just do that for ourselves, we do that for others. I mean, we can't be complaining about all the people and all the things at the church, and then we go, hey, you want to come with me? You know what? They're going to be like, uh, no. Why would I want to come to the place that you don't like, that you complain about all the time, that, that everybody's so bad? Why would I want to come? People want what is real and honest, and people want authentic, and that hasn't changed in 2,000 years. People want authentic. That is why it's so imperative that we devote ourselves to the things that the church and Acts devoted themselves to. God has called us to be authentic. And when we dedicate our lives to uh, following, learning his word and for prayer and remembering the source of our salvation and for caring for each other, people will see that and they'll go, that's a church I want to be a part of. That's something I can be interested in. And they then can be led to salvation. And we might have the opportunity to see people come to Jesus daily. That would be amazing. But everything done collectively starts personally. Everything done collectively starts personally. And we can each only control ourselves and what we decide to do. So the first step to decide for yourself is to decide to make Jesus your boss and Savior. If you haven't done that, that is your first step to being part of the church and living this out is making Jesus your boss and Savior. And we call that getting on base with God. The B is to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, living God. A is to admit I'm a sinner and I need a savior. S is to surrender, say, God, you're in charge, and I'm going to devote myself to these things. And E is to express that in Christian baptism. That's the first step in being part of God's church, and it's how we are saved through Jesus' sacrifice. But I know many here have been part of the church for a long time. You've accepted Jesus' salvation. You have followed Jesus. You've gone through, you're gotten on base with him. And if you've done that, then here is our mission for this week. I am asking you to be introspective and look at what we are doing individually in each of the areas that the early church was devoted themselves to. Are we studying God's word? Are we intentionally building relationships to strengthen us and others? Are we praying? You know, are we continually focusing on the source of our salvation? Which of these do you struggle with? Which of these do we struggle with? And this week, work on that. Maybe it's prayer and you're like, I got it, I have to pray more. I need to be connected to God. Maybe it's study. It's like I haven't opened up the Bible. You open up and moths fly out. I don't know what that is for you, but find that area and take some time to intentionally strengthen it. You see, we're a church that comes together to do all these things. And for us to make a difference in the community, we have to be an example of what caring, of what commitment, and what love looks like. And that starts with us individually. And like I said at the beginning, the level of godliness within a community starts with how much influence we let God have individually in our lives. So my prayer is this. My prayer is that you will let God lead your life, and through that, we will hopefully be a church that gets to see people added to their number daily. You see, we can be a place where people are saved and lives are being changed. But that all starts with our personal decision to be the church. It all starts with the question, what are we devoted to.